Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin momentarily.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We are about to begin. From 13 colonies, we became one nation. A nation of immigrants became one people. But for generations, barriers have been erected and systems have been designed to divide us. Our team traveled across the American South, unearthing the roots of this divide, the ghost of the past, and the human experiences that bind us all. We've gone to 28 communities across 13 southern states, in rural areas and urban ones, growing metropolitan areas and hollowed out main streets. We've talked one-on-one, -on -one, in roundtables and in focus groups. Over 800 people in all have shared their life stories with us. We found that many white people still lack an understanding of the scope, scale, and depth of racism in America. That we continue to lead deeply segregated lives that arts, culture, and sports bring people together, that across race and class, people all want the same thing, an opportunity to provide for themselves and their families. We can imagine a new inclusive South born by correcting false narratives, championing transformative policy change, and cultivating a new generation of courageous leadership. You see, racism isn't a black or white problem. It affects everything for everyone which means it's our problem. It was designed this way. So now we have to redesign it together so that we can prove the original American promise, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Join us. Please welcome the founder and president of E Pluribus Unum, Mitch Landrieu. Hey, everybody. Wow. 
you guys look spectacular. Thank all of you for joining us today. Hey, Michelle. Uh, it is a really special day for so many reasons, and I think the best way to start this moment off, if you will allow me for a couple of minutes, is with gratitude to thank those that have helped us so much. And I want to start by thanking Lorene Powell Jobs, who is in the house. Lorene, where are you? Maybe she's in the back. Give her a round of applause. Lorene, thank you for... I want to thank her and the entire Emerson Collective family. We have been blessed with their expertise, with their guidance, and with their support over the 18 months that we have been doing this, and we are not here without them. So God bless you all, and thank you. I also want to thank our board of directors and our National Advisory Committee, and we are honored to have them as part of the effort. But I want to take a moment to give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of this amazing group. They are leaders and experts in art, in activism, civil rights, education, economic opportunity, history, policy, philanthropy, and more. So in addition to our National Advisory Board, which will be led by Lorene, Angela Glover Blackwell is founder and resident of PolicyLink, Donna Brazil, policy uh, analysis, professor, author, and voting rights expert, Bill Bynum, the chief executive officer of Hope Enterprises, President Bill Clinton, a son of the South himself, and a boy from Hope. Michelle Ebanks, who's with us today, president of Essence Communications. Michelle, thank you so much for traveling to join us. Oscar Eustace, who is the artistic director of the New York Public Theater. Drew Gilpin Faust, a renowned historian and president emeritus of Harvard University. Professor Henry Louis Gates, director of the Hutchins Center for African American and African American Research at Harvard University. Dr. Lomax, Dr. Michael Lomax, who is with us today. Michael, thank you for coming. He's the executive officer of the United Negro College Fund. Pastor Fred Luter, pastor of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. He is the former and first African-American president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Mark Morial, president of the National Urban League and former mayor of the city of New Orleans and former president of the United States Conference of Mayors. Adam Silver, commissioner of the National Basketball Association. And Kathy Behrens is here representing the commissioner today. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. And then finally, Cleo Wade, artist, poet, author, activist, uh, who is going to join us today. Mr. Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation. Uh, and of course, we have two wonderful mayors who are on our National Advisory Board, Mayor Greg Fisher, who's with us today. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. He'll tell you that it's the House of Bourbon and the home of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> rumble, rumble. And uh, and also Mayor Mike Nutter, who is uh, until recently the mayor of Philadelphia. Both of those gentlemen were also presidents of the United States Conference of Mayors. Uh, we also have with us today uh, Mayor Simmons, who is from Greenville, who's including Dr. Walter Kimbrough, president of Dillard University, and Arissa Littleton Staub of Delgado. We have a special group of students with us. These are the Senior Accelerated Civics Constitutional Law class that I am happy to teach with Mr. Walther at Luscious School. Y'all in the house, stand up so everybody can see y'all. There you go. Woo! I'm learning, I'm learning a lot, a lot from them. Also to our founding board members, Norma Jane Savison, Ruth Coleman, Tyrone Walker. You guys, thank y'all so much for your work. And finally, the individuals from the EPU team that have spent countless hours traveling with us, listening and learning across the South. Judy Reese Morse, who is the president of the Louisiana Urban League, Dr. Roxanne Franklin Loria, Shannon Barr, Shauna Lewis, Hayne Rainey, Jane Russell Brown, Ryan Burney, and finally, Scott Hutchison and Sarah Miller, who have really done the heavy lifting uh, all throughout this way. And Jamie and Robin, thank you all for your special help. Um, thank you. <laughs> Policy Link, Bennett Midland, um, and Jim Gerstein and Carl Agnew. And I want to just thank all of the people, some of here today, that actually joined us in these communities across the South that have traveled here today. And you'll hear more about them later. So as we begin, it's important to note that our nation's great many riches are rooted in and harvested from the misery of enslaved people who first arrived in America 
from Africa 400 years ago. And in that Declaration of Independence, you know it, it says all men are created with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So immediately you must recognize that we were a nation that was born in contradiction. Our beloved United States has been divided from our earliest days in many times in anger and hate and in fear. Slavery was this nation's original sin. And if we dare to be truthful with ourselves, we have to admit that we have not yet in this country fully reckoned with the issue of race. As a result, generation after generation of black Americans were treated as second-class citizens, subjected to Jim Crow laws and widespread de facto segregation. Today, inequities continue in neighborhoods, housing, schools, health care, voting precincts, public transit, banks, at every step of the criminal justice system. We were in many ways divided by design. My father, who is listening, streaming from home, and I love him very much because this work is very much in the spirit of what he's been doing his entire life with Dr. Norman C. Francis, said to me, he goes, you know, I have so many white people that tell me, Moon, that was such a long time ago. We didn't have anything to do with it. And he told me this story the other day. My father is 89 years old. He was born in 1930. He said to me the other day, he said, son, I knew my great-grandmother. He said, I hugged my great-grandmother. She kissed me. She helped raise me. She swatted me on the butt when I got out of the way. He said, that woman was born in 1849. She was 16 years old when President Lincoln was shot. She touched me, and I touched her. That's how close we are to where we were, and it was not that long ago. It is our mission to recognize that if we don't reckon soon with our past, we face a future of uneven fissures and failures. But if we do, we have a future of limitless potential in our country. In the South, given our role in the slave trade, especially here in New Orleans, given the backlash to Reconstruction, given the lasting effects of Jim Crow, given our inability to really release the stranglehold of our past, it seems to me that we here in this room have a special obligation to tackle the issue of race head on as a steps toward bringing people together. And so in my work in Louisiana over the last 30 years and my family's work before that and so many others in the community on whose shoulders we stand, we have to ask ourselves how we can do a better job of seeking and finding common ground. How do we confront the issue of race? How do we tell our nation's full and complete and rich and tough and hurtful, but beautiful history? How do we lift up the truth as a means to move our country forward? And in bridging the racial divide, trying as we can to find reconciliation, where there is no justice, there is no peace. By envisioning a new, more inclusive South, how do we help America live up to our founding fathers' aspiration and our promise to each other? How do we help fulfill that commitment that we made? We ask these questions because we obviously believe that it is possible. And that's why we're launching E Pluribus Unum. Everybody should visit us at E Pluribus Unum, unumfund.org, or dividedbydesign.org. Our mission, our purpose, our focus is to showcase the power of coming together and highlight that out of many, we are one. That is, in fact, what E Pluribus Unum means. And if you're wondering, it is one of our nation's mottos that has been with us since the beginning of our time. But it seems to me that we can only fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity for all if we break down the barriers that, in fact, divide us. And we have to redesign the systems that hold us back, that were designed, actually, to keep us apart. As you may have heard, and we'll hear many more times today for much of the past year, we traveled across 28 different communities in 13 southern states. We spoke to over 800 people from all walks of life to learn firsthand what unites us and why we still remain divided. We completed a survey of 1,800 residents, 600 each white, black, and Latino, across the same 13 southern states earlier this month. And it affirmed what we heard about people's lives and experiences from the personal interviews that we did, some of them lasting more than an hour. While sobering, 
Our travels gave me hope about our work for the country. And despite the major differences in personal experience and perceptions among different racial groups, more people share a common belief that diversity strengthens a community than divides us. Our polling and focus groups showed us that people of all races and backgrounds understand that, quote, in order for America to reach its full potential, all Americans, all Americans, regardless of race, must have equal rights, the same economic opportunities, and the same access to quality education. But here's the thing, agreeing in theory, as you know, is just the start. It is clear that we have a lot of work to do. In our report, we highlight some numbers clearly to celebrate, but we also have some numbers that motivate. It is a fact that the South is becoming more diverse by the day. It is a fact that we have major economic hubs that are thriving because of our diversity, not in spite of it. But we know the other side of that coin. On health, on criminal justice, on education, on upward mobility, the racial gap and more, the South lags behind every other place in the country. One of the reasons for this, we learned, is that many white Southerners that responded to our meetings and to this survey, who largely remain in charge of major systems and institutions, do not have a complete history, well, a complete understanding of our history because they didn't learn it right the first time. And so they don't understand that the playing field has been tilted towards them in a way that has provided significant socioeconomic advantages and privileges over the course of generations. Most black respondents, on the other hand, reported that they have experienced discrimination because of the color of their skin and still feel the systemic biases and obstacles resulting from the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation across the South. In our survey, three quarters of black residents attributed poor economic situations to lack of opportunity. Meanwhile, a plurality, 44% of white residents, attributed poverty to poor life choices. You can see how people similarly situated view the world differently. That to me is a big part of the work. How do we get more white Southerners and white Americans to understand our history and to work to correct the inequities and imbalance and opportunities that exist still today. Answering that question is the central mission of EPU. Our polling also showed that most black, Latino, and white respondents report that they frequently interact with people of other races at work, at school, at community cultural events, sports events, festivals, and fairs. That's good news. We have seen and heard a lot about culture and sports being a key driver behind interactions with people of other races and ways to bring the community together. Anyone who's been to a Pelicans game or a Saints game knows that. I get a little hoot at from y'all. <laughs> Our research suggests that there is a path towards a more prosperous future for all groups across the South, but it is going to require a serious, a sustained effort to expose each group to the lived experiences of people that live in other communities. And through this work, I hope so that in the national public discourse and conversations in our community, issues of race and class will be discussed in a more thoughtful, empathetic, nuanced, and thoughtful way that do not exacerbate social divides, but rather build common ground. That leaders at all levels will set new, ambitious priorities to enact substantial changes in policy to redesign institutions and support more equitable outcomes and that all people will have a deeper understanding of systemic racism and the ways in which they can act on issues of racial and economic equity every day. We have to act as one nation, not two. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all, not some. We can break down the barriers that have divided us by design. In taking this charge, we will ultimately prove our American motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one, and we will all be better for it. As I close, I am reminded of the fierce urgency of this moment. As we sit here and as we speak, this nation is laying to rest one of our great leaders, Elijah Cummings, who is being memorialized by President Clinton, who but for that moment would actually be here today. President Obama, John Lewis and James Clyburn and many others. He was a great fighter for civil rights and social justice. 
In his first speech as a member of Congress, he recited a simple 46-word poem that I would like to share with you today. I have only a minute, 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I did not choose it, but I know I must use it. Give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny minute, but eternity is in it. That sums it up pretty good. We must use every minute of every day, seek and find common ground, to use our diversity to bind us together and to make us better, and to thereby restore America's promise for us all. That is our mission. Let's get up into it. Thank you. Many white people lack empathy for and an understanding of the scale of racism in America, including our racial history and how it still permeates today's institutions. As a result, racism is too often narrowly defined as overt individual actions rather than systemic injustices. As an individual who's I've grown up in Mississippi, I only begin to have overt racist experiences when I left the state of Mississippi. Now, coming back as an adult, I was able to see the systems that were racist, right? I was able to see the structural and institutional problems that we have that created and colored my experience. We know we incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the country, in the world for that matter. Not only do we incarcerate more people, we, we know we disproportionately incarcerate more people of color uh, than the population supports. There's separation, there's hierarchy, and there's intentional lack of inclusion. Beyond the structures and systems, there's no doubt that there are individual acts of racism. A lot of folks don't think it exists because they don't see it in the way you saw it in the 30s and 40s and 50s, but it exists and what happens is that folk engage in what we call have a nice day racism or racism with a smile and a pat on, pat on the back, even to the point that the victim of that type of racism has no idea that he or she has been victimized. Uh, if we didn't have to go to the same grocery store or go to the same job, would we do it? And I would say probably not. Racism is very much in the water in our spaces and how do you isolate that molecule in your water to better understand how it affects your consumption of the liquid. I think we still have a lot of reckoning to do with our history, um, what we've done, where we've been, where we are now, and move forward to where we want to be. Now welcome the moderator for our first panel, Judy Reese Morse, joined by panelists, Mayor Greg Fisher, Kate Gluckman, and Dr. Tamika Simmons. Good morning, everyone. That was a great speech by former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, congratulations, Mr. Landrieu. I am really, really honored to be here with all of you. We are getting ready to have a tremendous conversation, really focused on what took place on the road, getting to this day, getting to this moment, getting to this launch of what we now know officially as E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. I wanna tell you a little bit about what we did before we got here, and then I wanna have each of the panelists start to share a little bit about who they are and what they're doing in the spaces that they're in. Last fall, the E Pluribus Unum team set out to listen to and learn from American Southerners about some of the most complex issues facing America today. You've heard about them, race, equity, economic opportunity, and violence. Over a period of nine months, covering many cities and several states, a very diverse team traveled to urban areas, suburban neighborhoods, small towns, and rural communities to meet people and hear their perspectives. This team believed that the first step in working towards solutions to these very complex and seemingly intractable problems is to hear people's truths. 
They heard from teachers, from coal miners, office workers, horse groomers, faith leaders, elected officials, and many, many teenagers. Their questions were very broad and open-ended, leaving a lot of room for people to tell their stories and tell their stories they did. We heard stories of pride and joy and promise, but also anger, frustration, and hopelessness. And while the perspectives differed, depending on who was answering the question, there was one thread that ran throughout every interview across every city across the American South, and that is these complex issues impact every single person, whether they realized it or not. So our conversation this morning is going to include hearing from some of the people who were a part of this tour. And as I said, we want to hear from you. We want you to tell us a little bit about your space and tell us about what you first thought about when you got the phone call. So you got a phone call from Mitch Landrew or someone on his team. And the message was that he and a team wanted to come to your space, come to your city, and talk about race, equity, economic opportunity, and violence. What in the world did you think when you got that phone call? Let's start with you, Mayor Fisher. I was excited. So uh, Mayor Lander and I have been doing work in this space for quite some time. And so I think one of the hallmarks of a strong city is that you lean into this type of work. And you don't engage it. It's there. And when you don't acknowledge it, it doesn't go away. So it provided another opportunity for us as a city uh, to come together, to explore our differences, to explore our commonality, and put the issues on the table. I mean, I can remember, obviously, if I would like for you all to think about, what did you think about when you saw the demonstration, civil unrest taking place in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, a couple of years ago? I mean, I had a physical reaction, you know, bile in my mouth, you know, kind of that queasy feeling in your stomach, saying, is this United States of America? And the unfortunate reality is that it is. But when you see the Klan marching and the neo-Nazis marching and uh, the leader of this country say there's fine people on both sides, if you're not stirred to act uh, as an individual, much less as an elected official, I ask, you know, what is the purpose of your life and why are you here? So we launched something called Lean Into Louisville. Uh, and Lean Into Louisville was launched as a reaction to Charlottesville because what I've found is that when people receive education and background around discrimination or any form of prejudice, their minds start expanding. What I've found is when people get together with people that are not like them, whether it be skin color, religion, ethnicity, whatever it is, the otherization starts receding. So we saw this as a tremendous opportunity to continue the work that we did in Lean Into Louisville and then bring somebody together. Uh, Mitch Landrieu is a, is a man of national prominence, especially after the speeches that he gave here when you all removed your statues in the city. Congratulations on that, by the way. Tremendous act of <laughs> civic leadership. <laughs> and so Mayor Landrieu is using his platform to make our country a better place. And so people were attracted to come and learn about that as well. So it was a great uh, moment for our city. Thank you for that. Miss Kate Gluckman, let's hear from you. You're from Sunflower County uh, in the Delta in Mississippi. Uh, tell us about your space, because I think there are a lot of people who are not familiar with your space. Uh, it is a very special place. It's a very challenged space. But tell us about your space and tell us about the work you're doing there. I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Sunflower County Freedom Project. We're a 20-year-old educational nonprofit working in the heart of the Mississippi Delta in Sunflower County. And this is really hollowed ground. This is the home of Fannie Lou Hamer, and it's also the home of the Citizens Council. And so our story in Sunflower County, I think, is the story of the United States. Um, and so when Mitch um, called to come and say, you know, we want to come and visit you. 
I said, wrong number. I don't, you know, we're, we're, we're a tiny organization. Um, but also I, I said, yes, absolutely. Because if you're not listening to voices in Sunflower County, if you're not listening to voices in the Mississippi Delta, then you're missing the narrative that's happening in our country and you're missing the narrative um, around both what remains as a challenge in race and equity and injustice, but also what's working and where there's hope. And I said, well, our students are brilliant and they need to be heard. And so yes, you better come and you better come fast because they have a lot to say. Um, so I was just really honored, um, but also felt a responsibility to share about the challenges in education that we still face in uh, the United States, in Mississippi specifically, and um, the need for us to address education in rural areas as a way towards equity and a way towards justice and economic opportunity. And so I was just really honored um, and our students showed up that day and they had a lot to say and had a great conversation with um, the organization. And one of the things that I really challenged um, people to do in E Pluribus Unum is to not just come listen to the stories because a lot of people come and listen to the stories and then nothing happens. And we have groups that come and, and this might seem really stark, but I think it's almost like poverty tourism to come to, to Mississippi and say, look at how bad it is here. And so I'm so excited to be here today to see the action that's gonna happen from the listening tour to be part of the solution um, and to promote our students' voices. So thank you. Thank you. I have a lot to come back to you on uh, about what you said. But first, my friend, Dr. Simmons, welcome. Dr. Tamika Simmons, uh, Delta State University. Uh, please tell us about the work that you are leading there, which is amazing. Well, uh, let me talk about when we got the call. Yes, yes, yes. So my reaction was similar is what Kate shared. And I thought, OK, let's go. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing racial equity, social justice work, it's a lot of folks that come to the table and say they want to be part of the party. And so my thoughts were, Okay, let's go. What you got? Uh, you want to come to Mississippi? You want to come into the Delta? Let's talk and have real raw conversation about what's happening. There is a war in the state of Mississippi, and that war looks very much like the war in the United States of America. Sometimes people ask, how can you live in Mississippi? And I ask, how do you live in the United States? <laughs> what's happening in Mississippi is what's happening in America. And so what I thought was really exciting about the opportunity that was presented was a chance to talk about that, gra that grassroots work, what we're doing on the ground, to highlight the voices and the people, to push back against the narrative that Mississippi is just letting things happen to itself. There are people on the ground fighting that war that we see folks fighting nationally. And every little bit and every little person and every little effort counts. And to be able to see that discussed on a national platform has been an amazing opportunity to again highlight that Mississippi is here. We are America. We are fighting just like the rest of America against all of the social ills that we see. And we are raw and we are tough and we are Southern. We'll give you some sweet tea. We're gonna give you some sweet tea, but you gotta be ready to work. And so it was just a great opportunity. So I wanna follow up with you just on that point. A lot of people believe that Mississippi is indeed still burning. Is it? What is your, what are your thoughts about that from you and from Well, from Mississippi is on fire like America's on fire. Uh, and what we see is um, this, this shifting of what racism looks like. And I know there's a current a uh, narrative and dialogue that's trying to redefine what racism is. We act like we don't know it when we see it anymore. It's the same old racism. Uh, and Mississippi is dealing with that the same way the country is dealing with that. And you see it a lot of times in systems and you've got to unpack what that means. Uh, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, just like the rest of the country, it's become so systematic when we talk about what education looks like, what the economy looks like, what the disparities in wealth looks like, it's become so much a part of your everyday life that you think it's normal. You think that it's just how things should be. 
And if we don't educate our children about, no, this, this is a systemic and organized effort to make sure your fabric looks just like this. Uh, and so uh, I think that when we, when we think about the work, some of the work is pulling back the mask, the mask that this is normal, the mask is this is the way it should be, the mask that uh, public schools are worse off than private schools just because they're public, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I think that's really important work, especially when talking with and working with young people, because it's the normal for them. And we have to make sure they understand this is not normal. Everyone does not have the same opportunities. Everybody is not um, doing some of the things that, that the stereotypes uh, project. Uh, and so I think that um, it's just, it's one day and one moment at a time. And we're in, in our state, we're, we're just on the ground trying to work toward that new South. Kate, would you talk to us a little bit about what the students that you work with uh, had to say when the e pluribus unum team came through? Sure, I, I think our students, because of their participation in our program and our emphasis on traveling in and through Mississippi, but also outside of Mississippi, they have context for their lives. They have context for their schools. And so when the E Pluribus Unum team came, they, our students really spoke about the injustice they saw at their schools. They spoke about having 10-year-old textbooks. They spoke about their, their classrooms leaking. They spoke about having no teachers in the classrooms and how they knew that wasn't what it was in other places just in Mississippi um, or outside of Mississippi. And they knew too that schools that had a, a majority of white students didn't have these issues. And so they asked why. They, they proposed ideas. They are generative meaning that, um, that they have solutions to their own problems and really they need the support and they need the, the funding and they need the, the structure to, to seek out those solutions themselves. And so, you know, we often say like, you can't just come with a problem, come with a solution. And our students have them. And I think we're seeing across the country that young people are pushing elective leaders to be held accountable for these systems, just like uh, Dr. Simmons was saying, that have kept them in place, that have kept their communities down. Um, and so I, our, our students want that as well, but I think in really rural areas, sometimes it's hard to say like, well, who is it? Or who can I hold accountable? Um, and, and so that I think is an opportunity that our students saw when the team came to say, you know, we want change and, and we have some ideas. Thank you for that. So Mayor Fisher, when the E Pluribus Unum team uh, went to Louisville, uh, they joined you uh, with a number of faith leaders. Uh, I want to know what your faith leaders had to say and how did they feel about being engaged around these, these complex issues? Yeah, so one of our city values is compassion. And by compassion, we mean respect for each and every citizen so their full human potential is flourishing. And also he's asked, what is the purpose of a city? Uh, the purpose of a city is a platform for human potential to flourish. And it's not just a certain group of people, and it's not just white folks, it's not just Muslims, it's not, it's not just Hindus, it's everybody. So we have a strong interfaith tradition in Louisville. We're 25 years now into our festival face that people come from all over the world. And what that has done is introduce each people to pe folks that are different like them, like I mentioned before. So the tough thing is, is when you have a challenge in the community, if it's the first time you're coming together and you don't know each other, that's a problem. Every community is going to have some tragedy, some type of disaster. So the question is, do you turn into each other to lift each other up, or do you turn against each other? So the interfaith work has presented a great platform for us to get to know the entire community. And different people come into it at different times with these conversations. You find uh, where people would say, this is a tough conversation about race or religion or Muslim extremism, whatever it might be, any type of religious extremism. The more you expose people to these conversations, the more normal they become. And usually the broader their mind and their consciousness gets as well. So our interfaith uh, community has put, played a really important role 
with us to understand all forms of discrimination and what it looks like in a community and what we can do about it as well. So it's another way into the conversation. Uh, what we found is particularly what I found as a white male mayor where I can talk about privileges that white people have and especially privileges that white guys have. You know, when you have that conversation initially with a group of white men in particular, I mean, you see a lot of squirming in the seats. You know, but as you explain what it means, it doesn't mean you didn't work hard or you don't, uh, you know, you don't deserve what you have. It just means there's a whole bigger picture out there that you may not have considered before in this system we call life. And if you want to move forward in the best way for you and your family, how does the system become optimized? Not just you as a white man. And so you come into this conversation, I've found, either through a moral lens, just saying, you know, it's not right. I mean, this is just something that I feel. So we get a certain amount of people in it that way. But then the next lens is an economic lens. That's like, and Mitch would always used to say this, demographics are destiny. Our country is changing. So if you're a business and then you knew that, wouldn't you want to plan for what the future is going to bring? Different workforce, different skills, who are your customers going to be? Are they going to have the buying ability to buy your stuff? 80% of our economy is a retail economy. So I'm a business guy, let's say, but I may not really get the moral thing, but I get the economic argument. And then the last lens is just a public safety lens. When the disparity of wealth and income gets to a certain point, the folks that don't have it are going to say, enough of this. I deserve to have food on my table. I deserve to have health care, education, housing, whatever it might be. And just I'll close with this uh, story. It was in Germany uh, several years ago. I unfortunately, I had an ugly American on the trip with me, and we were at a company. And he was laughing at the Germans and just said, you guys pay more in taxes than America does. What's wrong with you all? And he, he looked at him and he said, Mr. Smith, we learned 300 years ago that when the poor people don't have enough money, they come and take our money. So it's a public safety issue that people deserve the basics to live. And so when you put all that conversation around a religious interfaith context, and they're spreading that word to their flock, it helps to normalize the work that we need to do. I'm, I'm very interested in knowing about conversations, Mayor, that you may have with other mayors, uh, whether they're other mayors in Kentucky, you have a very diverse state uh, that deals with different issues, but also mayors just across, uh, across the country. Um, what are the kinds of conversations that you're having with them about these issues? We know how critical mayors are in any city. Uh, their leadership is very important, and their lack of leadership around these issues uh, can really determine a city's future as well. So can you share with us about some of the conversations that you're having with other mayors? Yeah, so we look for mayors that prioritize this kind of work, right? I said earlier, a city's a platform for human potential to flourish. All citizens. And are you going to address these issues head on, or are you just going to not have that as a priority? It's uh, people get uncomfortable with these conversations. Well, that's fine. That's why we need to have them now especially in the context of what the country is, is going through right now. So some mayors take this work on, uh, some do not. You focus in urban areas, in particular in metropolitan areas, on what's the effect of this on our young men and boys of color. Uh, that is the demographic in our society that is most challenged uh, by so many issues, including institutionalized racism. So that's kind of an urban metropolitan conversation. And then when you go out into the rural areas, of our country. I mean, this is really one of the biggest challenges we have, right? The rural urban divide, the otherization that comes with that, the media's portrayal as our rural areas as, you know, kind of backwards. And so this is the political walls that we're dealing with right now. So when I talk in particular with mayors and county judges from, uh, let's say, Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky, these folks have gone through a tremendous hemorrhaging of their communities. They happen to be usually 95% white or so. But when America loved the cheap coal that they were producing, we loved Appalachia. <clears throat> but as soon as we had another energy source, these communities were dropped like a hot potato. And the opioid crisis moves in. So if you tell a white guy 50 years old in Appalachia who's laid off a coal worker, he's got black lung, He's lost a child to an overdose. His other kids are addicted right now. And you tell him he's got white privilege, you know, he looks at you like you got three eyes. 
So we have got to understand that there's all kinds of challenges that we're dealing with here. And when you take a look at the similar challenges, let's say, of poor rural America and the urban areas of America, they're not very dissimilar. But that coalition has not come together in a way from a political standpoint that is, needs to drive the kind of change that we need to see in our country for all of America, whether it's rural or urban. And I might offer, and I'd love to, to hear from uh, the two ladies from Mississippi, uh, the reason that that is not the case, that that coalition has not yet come together is we really have not dealt with the root cause, uh, the real fundamental issue about how the country was founded, how the country was built. Uh, I love this, this phrase, divided by design, because I think that that is exactly correct. Uh, so I'd love to hear from both of you uh, more of a race issue uh, in the, the places where you're from. Uh, and I would absolutely love to know what uh, our young people think about that. What we, I don't think we can get to the coalition, Mayor, that you talk about until we really do all of the work that we need to do at the root cause of this. The, that idea, this concept of divided by design, going all the way back to the founding of our country. Uh, well, in terms of young people, uh, at the university, in, in, in context with my work, I work at Delta State University. We're a small, traditionally white institution. We've got about 35 students, uh, faculty, staff there. Uh, and we are um, uh, an institution historically established for farmers and farming families. The Mississippi Delta region is uh, agriculture is king. Uh, and we have some of the richest land in the world. And that exists alongside the Delta also being a food desert. Uh, and so there's poverty that exists alongside wealth. And our students uh, oftentimes come from the context, we primarily educate kids from around the university, they are neighboring cities and towns. And they come in, um, a lot of them, most of the students of color are coming in from the public school systems of the Mississippi Delta, where they've spent K-12 in a segregated system. Our white students come in, they've spent K-12 in a segregated private context. Uh, and when they come to the university, uh, this is their first time in a diversified experience, if you can describe it like that. And many of our students, once they receive their education at Delta State University, they go back to our community. Some of them, they want to leave. They go to big city Memphis, or they go to Arkansas or other places. They go to Texas where uh, they feel like jobs and opportunities are better. But a lot of them go back into our cities and towns. And so the university experience is critical because that's going to be the most diverse experience they're going to have before they transition into the life of a grown-up professional and get that real job. And so it's really, we're really sensitive to the work that we're doing around our local government leadership institute and also our race relations conference that the experience that they have on campus may be the only one they'll have before we let them loose into the world. And so we're really sensitive to what students are thinking and what they're saying. A lot of them are plugged in and they see it for what it is. They're in the social justice club and they're in all of these organizations to really try to mobilize and try to find their way and see where the work is. And part of our job is to help them to know where the work is. But then we have a lot of apathy. We have students that feel like everything is fine. I've got lots of white friends. I've got lots of black friends. And so that, that's, that's really all that's needed. Uh, and so we really listen to that, particularly for those students who are disconnected because we feel like we have to make that connection for them. Uh, and trying to, to infuse that into the curriculum, into the academic space, um, but also trying to make sure that outside of the classroom, they have a place where they can plug in. Because at our institution, sometimes they're gonna have a professor to say, well, this race thing is not important. Uh, this, what you're talking about, that's, that's not important. You've got a chemistry exam and what you're doing across campus with so-and-so and so is not important. Uh, and so we ally with our faculty to make sure we have voices within every discipline that can say, in chemistry, these are the challenges. This has been what's been happening for folks of color in STEM, or this is what's been happening for folks of color in, in the humanities or in psychology, or this is how race is relevant to mathematics. 
right? So we have to be intentional about forming those allies so that our students hear the conversation at various levels. They get it in the classroom, they get it in our programming, they can plug into some local org organization or effort in order to be able to get on the ground. And so we're listening intently to what they have to say and we, we really find our work in trying to target those students that don't yet get it. And there are some that they think they get it. We've got grown-ups that think they've got it. Uh, but uh, we really want to target those students that feel like, this is really not important. That was 60 years ago. That's really, really not happening today. And we have to highlight for them that your existence and opportunity and your experience even now at this institution has already been colored for you that was those 50 and 60 years ago. You've got to unpack what that means for your experience. So we, we listen closely. How does the university interact with the community? To your point, you have students who are coming from lots of different parts of your state. Uh, as you said, some for the very first time, <coughs> interacting with people who are different than they are. I'm wondering, does your university, in your opinion, do a good job of connecting what's happening on campus to what's happening in community? In my opinion, we could do a better job. We're, we're trying, um, but again, just like Kate highlighted, we have the home of Fannie Lou Hamer right next to spaces with uh, the White Citizens Council. And so um, at the university, we, we, we can do a better job of connecting to the community. The, our challenge is that as a white institution that was founded for white farmers, we have a history of mistrust in the surrounding community, which is primarily a community of color. And so already folks don't feel welcome on campus. Sometimes our students have the story where their family members ask, you're going to Delta State? Why, why do you want to go there? You know they're racist over there, right? Because that's, that's somebody they know had that experience. Much to, to what Mayor Landrieu shared, this is not, these kids aren't experiencing what they read into a textbook. Their mothers and fathers are telling them these stories. Their grandparents and cousins and uncles are telling them about something that happened to them on campus. So as we do the work on campus, we have to recognize that our reputation is bad. Our, and we're pushing against that and we're having to reestablish trust. And so we have to position ourselves to know that we've got to go where the community is. If you build it, they will come does not work for us because we've intentionally kept folks out for so long. We've got to be ready, ready to go out, to sit in some folks' church services, to sit at some folks' dining room tables, to have intimate conversations and establish real relationships in order to start repairing. So we, we're doing some work, but we have to do more. Uh, and it's, it's just a, a work in progress to see how that's going to translate in an academic context where you got a lot of folks feel like, look, th this is not our job to do this. I, I'm supposed to be teaching chemistry. Right? We're supposed to be educating students uh, uh, in, in, in their disciplinary area, but it's like, okay, you can be an educated fool, right? You can know all you need to know about science and history and math, right? And then go out and make a fool of yourself because you have no idea about how to move and exist among different types of people. Uh, and so um, we can do better. We're trying, it's one program at a time, it's one effort at a time, it's the continuing to try to convince some folks on campus who don't feel like the work is important. Uh, and then it's, it's, a, it's a supporting of those folks who see that it's important. And sometimes you feel like you're running in circles. Uh, so just, it's, it's ongoing. No, 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 I, I absolutely agree with you. I wanna come back uh, to a point that you made in just a second, but I'm wondering, Kate, if you have heard uh, from your students maybe about uh, instances in the classroom where perhaps uh, there was a teacher uh, who didn't acknowledge something that was very obvious uh, because he or she didn't feel like uh, that was what is supposed to happen in a classroom. Do your teenagers and the, the young people that you work with talk to you about those kinds of instances? Oh, absolutely, every single day. Um, and it's not so much that someone says something, but that they make assumptions that 
uh, illustrate their bias. So I'll give you an example. We have students who are um, applying to college this year and they're motivated, they're highly successful, so they're applying now. They're getting their early applications in and um, their counselor at school is like, you don't need to apply now. Like, you know, we'll go, we'll apply in, in the spring. And this idea that our students wouldn't be seeking the most selective and the most uh, rigorous and the most prestigious deadlines just tells me a lot about what they expect our children to do for the rest of their lives. And so it's those kinds of instant instances that dishearten our children. And they say, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Like maybe people like me don't do this. And I think combating that narrative combating the idea that I'm that a kid from the Delta can't go and study at our best universities and can't apply early and can't get all the scholarships is something that we continuously have to push against and it breaks my heart that people within the school district within the school system would be creating those feelings in our children when they should be doing the absolute opposite and so that's really I think wh where we see racism or classism, um, our students pushing against those ideas and uh, where we continuously fight and, and try and call people out on, on those assumptions that, that keep our communities down. And so what do you do every day in your work with them to help them to see beyond what they may experience, to get beyond what they hear, to know that their visions of their futures can actually uh, come true? Yeah, well, we start from a place of understanding privilege, just like the mayor said. What experiences did I get because of my lucky draw of what family I was able to, to be born into or the color of my skin or where I was born? And how did those experiences help me get to, to be, in, to have a life that I feel free in? And that's really our goal with our kids, so the, to give them or, or allow them to seek the freedom of choice. And, and so we start by saying, well, knowledge is power. And so we're going to make sure our students understand exactly how to get into college and what college is all about. And we're going to teach them about why their schools, like Dr. Simmons says, continuously fail and why their communities are that way so that they know it's not because they're lazy. It's not because their families don't work hard. It's because there are systems of oppression that keep them that way. Because that that's empowering in some ways to say, like, I can change this. It's not who I am. It's these systems. And so that's really empowering. Um, like I said, we take a lot of trips with our students. We send them uh, to experience other educational opportunities um, outside of Mississippi. We say yes when people want to come in our doors because we know that exposure to our students will, will provide them context. So, so it really is about well, what, what privileges or what opportunities does, does um, a kid in you know, an affluent community get? And can we create those for our students? And overcoming the challenges of being in a really rural area, which I think is really unique. Um, I was going to ask you yeah. to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, what your work might look like if you were in Jackson, Mississippi, versus being in the, in the Delta. What do you think the differences are? Well, I can tell you we'd put a lot less miles on our vans. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we serve students that are 50 miles apart. Um, and, and we have to, because unless we go and pick them up, they don't have access to these services. They, they don't even have access to internet, right? So, so we have to provide them. We have to go to where they're at, to go to where their families are at. Dr. Simmons talked about food deserts. Sunflower County, a community of about 1,000, we're being generous, um, doesn't have a grocery store. There's nowhere to buy fresh fruit, fruits or vegetables. And so unless someone has a car and, and has the gas to go 20 miles, they're, they're going to be eating out of a, out a gas station. And so I, I think this idea of transportation and access is crucial to addressing racial inequalities, economic inequalities in a rural area. And I don't have solutions other than getting behind the wheel and, and driving, um, but it, it is something that I think uh, people who are making policy and people who are funding initiatives really need to consider that that cost is real and necessary. So what you just said and 
what you just said is uh, nothing new to a lot of people, uh, but it is brand new to way too many people. But it absolutely is frustrating. It is frustrating. It is unbelievable to me that there are people in the United States of America who have to live in the environment that you just described. This is so basic, it's so simple. So I wanna ask now all of you a very, very tough question. Why is it so? Why is this the case in the United States of America? Why? Well, <clears throat> obviously we need a national awakening. The denial of the history of our country, I mean, we're talking about a lot of issues around racism today, but let's talk about the founding of our country and what happened to the indigenous people uh, in America, basically slaughtered in uh, massive genocide, and then we built the economy of America on the backs of enslaved people. Where do we learn about that? You know, it's hidden in history books, and you know, I know that sounds so, if, if we were raising our kids, if we were raised with this as the backdrop for who we are as the United States of America, and we've just started with that reality, and then we go to the dream of Eflurba Sunum, then it's like, okay, we gotta acknowledge this, but we got a lot of work to do. And we have to define, redefine what wealth means. When I hear we're the richest and most powerful country on the face of the earth, and you look at the disparities that we have in our country on, on the basic needs for humanity, that is not what a wealthy country looks like. So we need to, so that's just, I, I just think the root of it is, is most people don't know. How is that possible? I don't know how it's possible. Well, that's so, why I'm asking Yeah, you. exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. So, so we got to do this boring stuff, like we got to reform our, our textbooks. We've got to have an awakening as a country that we can all be better together if we do this today. Because the United States of America, uh, I was talking with Angela about this earlier, we are getting the results that our systems are designed to produce. Okay, and most people don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. So how do we redefine our systems around education and healthcare and access for all? And when we say every child should succeed, we mean every child mm -hmm. in every circumstance should have a basic fundamental to have a bright and hopeful future and that's what they look forward to when they get up in the morning, not to be oppressed by all these systems that are keeping so many people down. So we've gotta start with basic education and demand reform uh, from elementary level on and community discussions on let's really understand who we are, where we came from, and where we need to go because it's better for all of us. Many people who are gonna speak today are much smarter and know a lot more than I do about this, but I know that if we can get more people voting then change can happen. And so I want the biggest, boldest ideas about how to do that in terms of automatic registration, voting holidays, guaranteed transportation to polls. And if we can get that, then I, I think we can make the changes that you speak of. And I also think that in addition to the voting, just the continued education, um, how is it possible? It's possible because it's intentional and it's strategic and it happens every day. There's not a day off on this effort. This happens every single day. And so we've got to be intentional, we've got to be strategic, and we've got to be on every single day in our push against it. The voting is so very important, but we've got to hold folks accountable once they get in the office. You don't just skate by. Right? You don't get to be a career politician and your community looks the way that it does. So how do we teach people how to have the voice to say it's time for you to sit down, right? And to provide support for those candidates that are gonna actually get the help to the people where they need it. Until people feel empowered in that work and until they feel like they can be part of that work, then we're gonna have what we have. And so I, I, I think that it, I, it baffles me but you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's how many hundreds of years now we've been dealing with this? So it's one step at a time. You, you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You change the movement one generation at a time. It's not gonna be perfect when we're done. And when my daughter gets into this work, she's six by the way. When she gets into this work, 
It's not going to be done when she's done, right? It's, it's always going, and we cannot get tired. We have to stay on the ground. We have to teach our children. We have to make them feel important. And then, and only then, can we start to see the fruit of our labor and the fracturing of these systems and these ideologies and these structures that oppress so many people. I really appreciate uh, hearing all of you say that. And I realized that I didn't answer the question that I asked all of you uh, when we started this conversation. Uh, so let me do that now. Um, I'm Judy Reese Morse, and I serve as the president and the chief executive officer of the Urban League of Louisiana. We are an 81-year-old organization, civil rights organization that promotes economic self-reliance for African Americans and other communities. We also promote parity and justice. And so when I got the phone call uh, saying that there was going to be this tour across the American South, to actually talk to black people, to talk to white people, to talk to anybody who would talk about these very complex, intractable issues. Uh, I said, yes, absolutely. The Urban League of Louisiana absolutely wants to be a part of that. Other Urban League affiliates across the South absolutely want to be a part of that because like all of you have said, I understand the importance of beginning the conversation but it can't just be a conversation. That's the starting point. There has to be action that follows. And so I'll ask you in the very short time that we have left for each of you to please tell me what you think needs to happen next and what you're most hopeful for. Where do you see the possibilities? Where do you see the promise? Where do you see the opportunity? We'll start with you, Dr. Simmons. Um, you, you just keep fighting. You, you keep your head down and you keep dodging and you keep pressing and you keep moving, you keep making folks aware, you, you get beat up and you get right back up. That, to me, that's the continued work. Because like I said, oppression doesn't take a day off. And so if we're gonna be champions, it, particularly for folks who can't fight for themselves, we cannot take a day off. Take a break, drink some sweet tea, and get up. Get up and get it done. Don't find yourself in so many conversations that you're not doing the work. And so I think that's really important. When we sit down, we strategize, we position ourselves, and then you get up and you do the work. You meet the people, you change their lives, one person, one moment at a time. You don't have to shift the nation, but make a change for a family, right? And we cannot grow tired in that. And so in terms of how I see things moving or what I'm most hopeful for in the future is the light in these kids' eyes. When I see that same fire burning inside, sometimes they don't know where to, where to put it. They don't know how to channel it, but it's there. And we've got to take those kids under our wing and we've got to position them in this race with us and we got to run. But we got to be ready to pass the baton and stop sitting on our laurels and keeping our kids back and not giving them voice. It's time for this next generation to take ownership of what America is. And so I'm hopeful in that the, the students we work with, the families that we work with, they're all in this together with us. And we truly are out of one, out of many one, because we all can, can join together in knowing that this is for the greater good for all. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Kate. I would just extend what Dr. Simmons says. Higher education continues to be the vehicle for the best chance of elevating someone out of poverty. I wanna see higher education be accessible to any student in the US. Um, regardless of income, and to have that be the place where really progressive and radical ideas about um, race and class and gender um, are, are discussed. And so, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Mayor Fisher, last words. We we'll use our pulpits to call for change and why it's good for everybody. And that's the talk. But then the question is, Dr. Simmons says, what's the action? You know, I don't watch the lips, I watch the hips. I mean, are you in the game? <laughs> you know, so where we're in the game in particular is around education because the future has to go through the classroom. So the question is, is are our kids prepared for the classroom? So we, our initiative's called Evolve 502. Its sole focus is to eliminate opportunity and achievement gaps 
So our kids that don't have advantage do not show up three years behind our kids with advantage at the age of six at kindergarten. And so wrapping all of our services around our kids, whether they come from a, quote, strong family or not a strong family, so they have a shot. And then at the end of that high school, there's a promise scholarship because the number one indicator, correlator, as you said, Kate, is if you get some type of post-secondary degree, you will break out of a life of poverty and have a life of opportunity. So it's grinding daily work, as Tamika said, but that's the only way you solve any problem. They seem so big, but that you can solve them one kid at a time. And there's all kinds of examples to demonstrate that. So I'll close, and maybe it's easier for me to say this, but I am optimistic about our future because we're facing these issues today in our history like we have not done before. Demographically, the number of folks that are facing them will be bigger than ever before. And when you look at us as a country and the beautiful diversity we have in the United States of America, no other country has that advantage. So when we wake up and learn how to utilize that as our core competitive advantage, the opportunities that will spring forth from that for everybody, I hope will be a model for the rest of the world. We have a lot of work to do, everybody, but let's get started. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you. So much about the South is about pining for and holding on to the past. Nostalgia. You hear the word heritage a lot, but we really never honor our whole history or the whole truth about our past. The way we hold on to history and the way we glorify it or romanticize it needs to stop. I just, I just don't think we're honest. I think we're romanticizing people. You know, we'll do Gone with the Wind and not talk about the destruction that happened during slavery and the Civil War. That history is palpable. I mean, you walk downtown and you're walking up streets that slaves were brought up, or you stop at the corner and you're at the corner that the bus picked Rosa Parks up on. Choco Bar, the epicenter of the U.S. domestic slave trade, has yet to be properly memorialized. Upper bottom. So many people were sold that the majority of African Americans today portray some ancestry here. That's important. That's sacred ground. The first thing people see and understand is the history of racism. Like immediately you think Emmett Till. You think about the struggles of Annie Lou Hamer. You're wondering if you can drive down the street and make it out safe. You really have that fear like it's Mississippi that's still burning. And I think that that's a very real expectation that people have. And if they see something different, they may be surprised, but if they see what they feel is the same, then they feel confirmed. I think getting all of Mississippians, particularly white Mississippians, on a common page about our racial history of injustice is a necessary first step. And as long as we sort of live in this neverland about the lost cause or it's always somebody else's fault, we won't get there. I think once we can face the truth about who the South is, you can see who America is because America has benefited from everything the South has done, then we can move forward. America will never be America until we've dealt with our genocidal beginnings and our, our racial underpinnings. I think until, until that happens, we can't heal ourselves. Please welcome to the stage the moderator for our second panel discussion, Laureen Powell Jobs joined by Mitch Landrew, Angela Glover Blackwell, and Brandon B. Mike Odoms. Hello. That was an excellent panel conversation about, about the lessons. And uh, now we're, we're pivoting to talk about the work, uh, the work that's required to bring about the change that we all are envisioning and know need to happen. So each panelist here will talk about his and her own experience and how they will assist in fulfilling the goals of the program of EPU. Obviously, Mayor Landry will speak about the leadership required, the leadership changes, and the leadership training. Um, Angela Glover Blackwell will speak about policy and narratives and 
Brandon, B. Mike, Odoms will talk about storytelling and narrative change that's required. When, when we think about the work that actually needs to happen, it's clearly deep and intentional work. It includes explaining the South's legacy of hate and exploring how the legacies of Jim Crow still exist today. A lot of people don't understand it. They don't understand the history. They don't know it. And it's, it's an invisible hand that, that touches each one of us. We have to understand why we must challenge each other to create pathways towards res reconciliation and healing and what that looks like in various communities. And I think together we have to envision a new American South where barriers to equitable participation in America's promise can be dismantled. So I'd love to start, Angela, with you. Um, your organization, Policy Link, partnered with EPU in the conversations across southern cities. Can you please help us understand how the legacies of Jim Crow persist today in the structures of our society and in the way that policies and laws are still written? Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on this. It's amazing that we're having this conversation now and with this level of honesty and depth. The previous panel and Mitch in your opening comments really made it very clear that we all have to push ourselves to get educated about how we really started and how we got here. The fact that the nation was founded on stolen land and built based on human bondage is not something that you easily move past. Mm -hmm. It brought with it a hierarchy of human value, with some human beings valued much more than others, white at the top of that and black at the bottom. And just getting rid of legal slavery did not change the fundamental narrative about who's worth anything and who is not. Mitch, I thought it was so helpful when you pointed out that your father talked about hugging a great-grandmother who was born during the time that slavery was happening. For myself, my own grandmother was born in 1886, just 21 years after slavery ended. My own grandmother, who I lived with, she died in 1968, I was in college. And when I hear her stories and my parents' stories, it's so clear that it's still happening now. There's a book that was written about two years ago called The Color of Law that makes the point that the beginning of the nation, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, and what that did to housing exists to this day. That First, people were pushed into neighborhoods that were lacking and less than. Redlining required that people could not buy homes if they were black in neighborhoods that were not already black. And if they bought homes, they could not get loans in those neighborhoods. So they, had, they bought houses that were cheap and they did not have 30-year mortgages. What is often not known is if you go to any inner city now and the communities that are the poorest, that suffer the most disinvestment, are the same neighborhoods that you could see on a redlining map from 60 years ago, the same neighborhoods. And so that progression has not brought progress with it. It's a classic example of not valuing people, creating laws based on not valuing people. And those laws then create a, an atmosphere in which the same thing goes forward. That people buy homes, they don't have value, they don't get wealth, the families can't send kids to college, they can't get through an emergency, and that's all because we didn't value them in the founding of the country. We made laws that put them at a disadvantage, and those same laws keep them at a disadvantage. So, so this valuing of, of each other and every individual is fundamental to the change that has to happen first and then aligning that, that value and that narrative change to new policies and laws. So can you speak a little bit about how you see that narrative changing? How does that narrative get changed? 
Yes, we have to move from an old narrative that didn't value. We have to move from a narrative that says that people who are doing well did it by themselves. The country cannot say we did this by ourselves when you begin with stolen land. The country cannot say we did this by ourselves when it was built on human bondage. Mm -hmm. The country cannot say that we did it by ourselves when we had laws that kept some people out. And just as the country can't say it, the individuals can't say it either. And you didn't mm -hmm. have to be aware of it to take advantage of it. We need a new story. We need yes. a new story that's not just a feel-good story. We need a story that actually reflects where we are. And this is where we are. That we need to stop being nostalgic for a time that never was. Huh. Because when we think, when we think back about perhaps when people thought things were great, it wasn't great for people who were living in these disinvested neighborhoods, not able to go to school. It wasn't great for people who were stuck children, who were working in the fields and not going to school. It wasn't great. That's a time that never was. But also, we have to stop ignoring a future that is inevitable. And the future that is inevitable is that the nation is dependent going forward and will become more dependent on the very oh, people who have been left behind. So we right. need to embrace that. That whether we like it or not, the nation is dependent on the people who have been left behind. So it's in everybody's interest to make sure that they're not mm -hmm. left behind. We need a narrative that lifts that up. But then we need to add something else to the narrative. And the mayor, uh, Fisher, talked about this. The other thing is, while of course we have a moral imperative to make sure we don't leave people behind, we have an economic, a democratic, and a national imperative as well. Because the nation is dependent on those who are being left behind to have the skills and the entrepreneurial yes. opportunities and the leadership qualities that we want reflected in the nation and the spirit of participating in democracy. If all of that doesn't come, the nation will not thrive. And the only way to get there is through policy change. Yes. And thank you. Beautiful. Um, Mitch, as you listen to Angela speaking and you reflect on the conversations Can that, she keep that talking? Part of, I know. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just... I'm just. You're, yeah, I know. It's, it's so enjoyable. <laughs> but, 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 but bring, bring other, other cities into this conversation. So all of the conversations that you took part of across the South, um, ha, do you have an indication that that narrative is starting to shift? What are some of the bright spots that, um, that really gave you some optimism and encouragement? Well, first of all, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed with, with all of you in this conversation today. And uh, just a couple things that I wanna approach. One, um, the, the idea that Angela just put in our mind, which is we never valued people. Um, and then systemic racism yeah. and institutions. So if the only value that a black man had to a white man 200 years ago was that you could till my soil, pick my cotton, and then produce a value for me, and that's all I could get from you, that's interesting, and you say, to them, well, if that's the only value that a human being has, then the only system that can make that happen is slavery. If you change the value proposition, that individual is equal to you. Not only, as, as Mayor Fisher said, in the three different lenses, is it just and does he, is there a right? But if, in fact, there was another way to do it and create systems that everybody does better, would you be interested in, like, how many, how much we lose by not having the benefit of people's intellectual capital, human potential, raw material. How many, how many incredible B. Mike Odoms are there in the world? A, a huge number. When you talked about the kids at the, the, the Sunflower, uh, in Sunflower County, every one of those children, if given an opportunity, could potentially change the world in a dramatic way. It's all really about seeing people's value. And a couple of things, need to happen in order for that to change. Some of it's happening already. Mm -hmm. One of them is narrative change. Essentially what that means is we gotta tell the whole truth. We have mm -hmm. to see people, we have to know everything, we have to tell the stories that were. And, and as, as Mayor Fisher said today, and, and Mayor Nutta knows this, when you expose people to those truths, it's really hard for them to walk away from the beauty of another human being in front of them that's a person of grace and dignity 
and great value. And so yes. as, that, as that work starts to happen, you start thinking about narrative change. Michelle Ebanks is sitting in the, in the front row. Michelle Ebanks is the CEO of, of Essence. And if you looked at TV 30 years ago, the only thing that you saw about an African-American woman on TV is that she was a domestic. Or you saw Gone with the Wind. Well, Essence has a huge platform where, I don't know, 300,000, 400,000 people around the country see and or come. And it's the largest gathering of African-American business leaders, artists, entertainers, and the world sees that. Yes. That, is, that is like specific narrative change so people can see a different thing that has been projected by the media. How you tell stories. The NBA is here. People, one of the things we found across, that they gave us great hope is where there was common ground. Everywhere that we went, people were like, sports brings us together. So in my opening speech, I said, have you ever been to a Pelicans game or a Saints game? That's a real thing. And if you use that to start changing the narrative about who people are and the fact that they can get along together and work together and they have great value, then it goes into the policy area. So Jason Williams is here, who's our council member at large, and, I, and that helps run the city. But in specific policies that we see across the city, and Mayor Nutter knows this, um, and, and, and Mayor Fisher, is that, for example, when Katie was talking earlier about her kids going into a classroom, well, these, you know, your kids, just listen to your kids. The kids in, in Louisville, Kentucky, Greg, when we were there, they said to me, Mayor, it's really clear to us. We can just look around our neighborhood, look at our school, go into the bathrooms where there's no toilet paper, look at our textbooks that are older. We don't feel very valued. We know that talent is equally distributed, but it's clear to us that opportunity is not. Now, how do you know that? That's such a profound thing. Well, they said, well, I don't know. We're not stupid. We can look at the nice school across the street. They got a big yard. They got beautiful grass. They got nice basketball mm -hmm. goals. They got great books. They have more teachers per ratio than we do, and a lot of those kids are going to come. Well, we're just as smart as they are. So when you think about how to change policy, there are very specific things that, for example, leaders can do to fix them. That, by the way, that classroom that Kate was talking about was designed by neglect. Everybody in America that deals with blighted housing and wants to get people to tear down houses, that house didn't get like that, like on purpose. It got that way because somebody neglected it. And the same thing is true about our institutions. And so. Jason's sitting on the city council, and all of a sudden, we see these differences in how our criminal justice system arrests people, uh, indicts people, and then sentences those individuals. That, what happens in that courtroom, is a result of what the legislature does in terms of passing mm -hmm. law. So when you go back and say, well, what's the judge's choice? Those choices have already been made on an upper level. Mm -hmm. That's designed institution, the classroom is an institutional design. Mm -hmm. in, in Mississippi, if I'm lying, I'm dying, I think this is right, that if you want to get elected statewide, you have got to win a majority of the state. But you also, may am I right about this? Have to win a majority of the counties. Now, if I can, I'm, I don't live in Mississippi, and I love Mississippi, by the way. My people are from Mississippi. But they, they are. But if you're an African American, mm -hmm. and you have both of those hurdles to get over, you're not jumping over that wall, baby. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. And that's the kind of and that's the kind of systemic struggle that you have to change. Systemic redesign that has. That's to what we're talking about. And is is that part of what you mean when you speak about building equity platforms? There's no well, yes, and then a more intricate dive. So when Judy Rees Morse, who was up here earlier, she was the, the CEO CAO for the city of New Orleans, we decided to have an equity agenda, which mm -hmm. meant that they could not bring a budget to the executive, I was the executive at yes. the time, unless they showed how it met, that we had equity across every you know, department of city government. This was gender equity and racial equity. And when you tell department heads, don't ask me for money, if you can't show me how it's distributed equity, but you know what? The design mm -hmm. of the city changes. So it's that kind of specific leadership. In, in private business, it would be as though the board told the CEO, don't come ask us until you show me what your equity platform looks like, who you're buying your goods from, who your customers are. Do you have equal pay for women? Do African Americans and women and Hispanics, does your, does your business look like you know, the rest of America? Don't bring it to me. It's that kind of top-down directive or demand from whoever the, the customers are from or from the shareholders that is going to produce really what, what, back to Angela, de facto, 
action, because everybody knows what the jury looks like. The law changed, and every night, Brown versus Board of Education, everybody thought, you know, they said, with all deliberate speed, my daddy told me, one, thank God. He goes, when he heard that in law school, he said, thank God, we're all done. Yeah, but and hearts now, and minds don't change. And now, well, that's exactly right. And so if you have to change hearts and minds, and then you have to change specific actions, then you move it over time. Mm -hmm. It's been very incremental. In, the, in where we are right now in the United States, it's a clapback where people are actually challenging the notion that diversity is a strength. They're challenging the notion that out of many, we are one. They are challenging the notion that we ought to be working for everybody. They're okay with it working for some. And we have to fight that fight, not only vocally, but we've got to do it in the work that we do day to day, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector or the not-for-profit yeah. sector. Um, Brandon, I'd love to talk to you about, about reaching hearts and minds, and especially hearts, because the role of the creative class has always been to allow us to connect and bring people together. And your public art has done just that. And I wonder if you can talk to people a little bit about your art. There's, there's some images that are coming up. Um, and, and what you've learned about narrative as your art has become more and more public. Yeah, I think um, at its best, I believe that art does two things. Um, I think it allows us to be a proper reflection of where we are. It's a mirror of what's happening in the moment. And I think also it allows us to see beyond the alternative. It, it allows us to, to well, think of an alternative and to see beyond the present. Um, I think that uh, culture all across the board, I mean, being from New Orleans, we understand the power of culture. And I think culture is like that thing that allows us to get proximate to other. You know, I think there's always this idea that the unknown is, is, is a fearful thing, but yet the culture is the first thing that we will let in the door, the food, the music, the literature, the, the visual art. And so I think artists bear that responsibility of saying, okay, if we're, if we're gonna be the first ones to be allowed in the door, then it would behoove us to, to, to make sure that we say what, what's necessary about the rest of us. And so I'm conscious of the fact that when I'm creating or, or making a piece of art, that I have to be reflective of my truth as well as those that are connected to me. Um, and to be clear, the status quo benefits individuals. And so it's not, it's not an easy thing to, to try to envision alternative to the status quo. So that's why art can also be seen as this revolutionary act or as this act of defiance because yes. we're providing an alternative. We're allowing people to see that this isn't right, like what's said on the first panel. Like this is not what should be normal. Calling attention. Yeah, to so it's church. calling attention what's different. Do you different. mind um, telling everyone what's happening here? So this is, um, <laughs> this was a block party that happened at an abandoned uh, uh, housing complex in uh, Algiers, uh, New Orleans, the West Bank, where I'm from. And basically it was an abandoned space. And thinking about providing alternatives to the present, this was an attempt, myself and 35 other artists, we went into this space and painted on the walls in an attempt to provide an alternative to what was present. And mind you, there are multiple ways to go down that journey. We could have went the route of, of you know, signing petitions, banging on doors, asking for investment. But we said, okay, we're artists. What can we do in this moment? And in the moment, it was like, okay, we have paint, we have time. And we use that to, in an attempt to provide an alternative to this image that we had gotten, became all too familiar with in New Orleans, this image of blight, this image of, of, of disinvestment in terms of spaces. So this was an attempt to do that and to call attention to it in a way that brought community together, to call attention to it in a way that says, okay, how can we be truthful? How can we think about the stories that existed in this space? the people who lived in this space who were no longer here and ask the proper questions of where are they now. Um, and so what you're seeing is this moment that was amazing to me in terms of this theory that came to life and this thought that, okay, art can bring people together is something mm -hmm. I've heard a lot, but this was a moment where it was in front of me. Yeah. Can I, can I give my interpretation of that? Yeah, sure. Because mine's a, it's true that what you just said. <laughs> For those of you that are not from here, y'all, you gotta be a Saints fan to understand it. But in terms of narrative change, and mm -hmm. artists, artists are the truth tellers, and then they're the seers. This is prospect one or two, this is two, one, around that. Yeah, it was around it, that time, yeah. Around that time. This used to be what people, white people would call a housing project that got abandoned. And back in the day, the only thing white people would think about that housing project and someone looked like B. Mike was that they would never go around this thing. 
And if they ran into somebody like B. Mike, their first assumption of him would be that he was a criminal, not an artist. And there were a lot of lives that got lost. And maybe they would think that he was in doing something he wasn't doing. That's the first time that many white people have been around that building in a long time. I think maybe 15,000 people came was, to this. It was a lot. Yeah. It was a lot. And it was startling from, from my perspective, being from New Orleans, to watch how many people who would never go in this space, they would never even go in this yes. neighborhood, got drawn to this neighborhood by this yes. spectacular young artist. And he changed the narrative, not just of the yeah. space, but of their life. But, and, and I would like to add, thank you. Um, one, I got I always like to shout out the collaboration, the, the collective. So it was, it was myself and a bunch of other artists as well. Um, but one thing that I informed all the artists in the process, which I think is also important when you think about art, because sometimes we can have the conversations about art for art's sake and have the conversations about art as this um, aesthetic thing that just makes something beautiful. One of the conversations in the beginning was this idea of truth telling, to tell all the artists that, look, these are not blank canvases. These walls are not blank canvases. Somehow there are stories on these walls that we have to collaborate with. And I think that's an important thing to think about in a, in a concept of, of, of policy change and thinking about how we can be empathetic and helpful to others is to know that this is a process of collaboration. This is not a process of going to the mountain and getting the answers and then coming down and saying, oh, behold, look, I have the answer. But it was a process of us going into the space and saying, okay, how can we listen? How can we understand? And how can that become a collaboration of, of, of interpretation or, or like a choir? You know, I like to think of it as a choir where there's all these voices that on their own are beautiful, I'm, I'm, I'm more than sure, but when they come together, it's just some, such a magical thing. And that's an example of the choir. All the artists, the community, the it musicians really that were on the stage, the community yes. leaders that stepped up to the stage to speak and address. And people leave changed. Yeah. So, so when you create public art, are you intentional about building bridges or does that happen organically? I think at its best, you have to think about it that way. The reason why I love public art because the word public is in the, in the phrase. And so it's hard to divorce public from the process. It, it'll be, and truthfully, you can tell the, the difference in public art when it is divorced from the public because you can see something to be like, I don't know what this is. What is this about? <laughs> and so for me, I, I never want that response with what I create. I want there to be this, this, this idea of, of representation that says, oh, this is familiar to me because this represents something that I love and something that I know. And so I think at its best, artists are supposed to, uh, especially in the public, I, I can't speak to the private practice in terms of what you do in your galleries and your studios, that's your own truth telling. But in the public, it's an opportunity to say, okay, how can we create that choir? How can I think about, and that's what I do when I travel. I'm blessed now to be able to travel and paint in spaces that I'm not familiar with. So for me, the process starts with going in, kind of like what you've been doing and having these conversations and saying, okay, before I even paint on the wall, I want to know the stories. I want to talk to people who, who live here, who deal with, because I'm going to leave once I paint the wall. Like, I'm done. I might not come back. But I want to talk with those who are going to have to deal with this for, for the duration of the wall. Are you finding that there, there's an increased hunger um, in other communities that you visit um, among the communities to have these kind of bridges built and to have that kind of resonance and to shine a spotlight on, on inequities and stories that haven't been told? Yeah, I think... It's like what you're saying about narrative change. I think people are hungry for the idea that their stories have not been represented properly. And um, so they're hungry for this idea of, of, of being able to authentically tell their truth. And I think art bears that burden in, in, in a good way. I think we shouldn't complain about it. I think it's important that when we create art and someone responds and say, wait, that's not exactly how it happened and that's not exactly how it occurs I think that's something we should be in tune with mm -hmm. and so I do feel like when I travel and when I'm meeting people there is this desire to say okay now I have an opportunity void of, of, of interruption or static I can clearly articulate what's important to me or what's important to us um, and you know like the African proverb I am because we are it's this idea that you know history often you know we the way we like to tell stories is that it's that one person that's the face of something, you know, but that's never true. You know, I think proper storytelling talks about the collective. It talks about the unit. It talks yes. about the, the many forces yes. that play that helped create that narrative or create that story. Um, and so when I travel, when I'm painting, I find that there's a hunger for that. Yes, that people are responding to the truth. And, and I'm really curious about this moment in time 
and to have launched E Pluribus Unum now. Um, and Angela, I, I want to hear from you, um, given the divisiveness of the public rhetoric and, and the separation of people that feels even more acute, certainly the partisan rhetoric is, is as acute as, um, as I've ever heard anything, um, the otherizing of people. What gives you hope that this is the right moment for EPU to do this work and that, that people are hungry for that kind of connectivity and bridge building? We are such at a moment in which it is the worst of times and it is the best of times. So let me just talk about the best of times for a second. I have hope because of what Mitch was just talking about when he talked about New Orleans bringing an equity lens to budgeting. There's a movement across this country to do this in cities all across America. It started in Seattle in 2005 when they started deliberately saying, who's being left behind? Let's disaggregate the data, find out who they are, what are their characteristics, what's their race, where do they live, and use that to be able to make decisions that bring everybody in. So it's happening all across the country. It's happening in Durham. It's happening in Asheville. It's happening in Knoxville. It's happening in Richmond. It's happening in Charlotte. It's happening in New Orleans. It's happening all across the South. People are setting up offices of equity. They're hiring equity officers. And in Fairfax, Virginia, they have started something called Fairfax One, in which every time they make a policy decision, they ask, what's the racial impact of this? What are we doing about poverty? How do we bring a racial equity lens to every decision that's being made? When you talk about empathy, this is empathy put into policy. How do you put yourself in the shoes of the people who have to thrive, for the community to thrive, and let that drive your decisions? I think that's a huge bright spot, gives me hope. There was a time when we couldn't talk about these things, and we have gone from not talking about it to actually institutionalizing it in government and impacting decisions about transportation, about budgets, mm -hmm. about education, about where we're going to put the development dollars. Right. So when we measure it, we can hold ourselves accountable to it. And unless we shine a spotlight and measure it and name it, we, we can't address it. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. There's so many other areas, though, that we've got to focus on. Can you speak about a few of those? I, I did, yes, because... <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> um, the, the area of incarceration. We all are grateful to Michelle Alexander for writing the book, The New Jim Crow. It woke us up to the fact that it's just slavery by another name, what we're doing. But it has taken a while for it to sink in that the people who are incarcerated, and they are overwhelmingly black and brown, are people who are often there for minor offenses. Many of them are there because they couldn't pay their bail. Many of them are there because there was some minor violation when they were on probation. Lots of people are there because they can't pay fines and fees that come from minor things, like not being able to fix up your garage or not being able to pay a parking ticket. You end up in jail. We have to understand deeply what a scandal that is for the nation and bring people home but understand that we have to bring people home into education, into jobs, into democratic participation. There's a whole world of policy work to undo a wrong that is as wrong as slavery. Now, can, I, can I, so that you don't think that she's talking about some distant place, can I tell you that New Orleans is ground zero for this? Yeah. That not too many years ago, Parish Prison, which is less than, I don't know, a mile from here, housed 7,000 African-American men. It was the largest parish. We have parishes. Y'all have counties if y'all ain't from here. It was the largest parish jail in the United States of America. We have engaged in aggressive criminal justice reform. I think our census just, what is it now, 1,100? 1,100 1, from 7,000 down to 1,100. Now, in order for that to occur, we had to change the system that produced the 7,000 result to make it an 1100 result. And when we rebuilt that jail, we had to make sure that they had other things in it. The same thing is true about cash bail. We just got sued. Uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said the way we funded our system was unconstitutional because too many men, because they were poor, were staying in jail longer than they had right. to. So you have to, you have to see the problem. Mm -hmm. You have to analyze the problem. You can use data mm -hmm. to actually focus on it so people can't lie about it. 
and then you have to apply it, and then when you do that, you can get to a different result. The 10-2 jury verdict that we just got passed, but we were the only one of two states that required, that allowed for a 10-2 jury and didn't require a unanimous jury to convict somebody. That's because it was put in place a long time ago because if a black person got on the jury, they could acquit an African-American right. defendant. So that's another institutional thing. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, we are in New Orleans. One of the reasons why here is because here, and it's all over the place, by the way, but we've got it. And so we want to address it. We have addressed it. And as Mayor Fisher and Mayor Nutter can tell you, all the mayors across America, this is where a lot of this work is happening, yes. where these folks are taking this responsibility and beginning to make that change. So I, I agree with Angela. We made a lot of progress. We got a long way to go. Um, and these are issues that we never used to talk about before, but now they're on the front of, front of the, mm -hmm. the burner for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we're coming to an end of this panel, I wonder if each of you can address the students who are in the audience today. We have a lot of students here. Talk a little bit about the role, and we'll start with you, Brandon, that you see them playing in, in narrative change, in cultural change, and then demanding just policies. Yeah, I think um, that idea of imagining an alternative to the present is so important. And I think students and young people have a better grasp of what that idea can be, because I think the older you get, the more connected you are to the ideas of those systems in which you are comfortable with. And the idea of the status quo is, is a thing, you know, it's a, it's a status quo, it's, it's there for a reason, it, it represents a sort of familiarity. Did I say the right familiarity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think for yes. students, it's, a, it's about this idea of, of being courageous enough to imagine an alternative to the yes. present. I think that takes various yes. forms, various outlooks, various mediums, but being courageous enough to say, this is not what's up. This is not the way it's supposed to be, and I'm going to do what's necessary. James Baldwin actually has a quote from James Baldwin who says, he said, we live in a sunlit, something to the effect that we live in a sunlit prison of the American dream. And the idea of that was to say, okay, it's not my job to hand out keys and say, okay, here, get yourself out. But it's to say, okay, how can I expose this cell? How can I shed some light on it and know that you're going to do what's necessary to say, okay, this is what it is, like I'm, I'm in this space, then okay, I'm gonna do what's necessary to get my way out. And I think all these students, the more information that's being available, they're starting to see, oh, this is what it is, and they're doing what's necessary to work their way out and to imagine spaces that are beyond this status quo that we've been so connected to. So I have great hope for them. And I agree, it takes radical imagination to be able to transform a nation that had this beginning and then get to where it is we need to be. So unleash your radical imagination, dream what you want, but then know that it takes more than dreams. You have to align your resources and your policy and your investments with the dream. We are divided by design, and we can be equitable by design. We can be just by design. We can be inclusive by design. Let that drive you as you're studying and thinking about how to hone your skills. And then know that there's no greater gift than the moment to be brave. If you get a moment to be brave, you have received a gift. The kind of leadership that steps into those moments is the kind of leadership I'm hoping that you all will bring. So I'll tell a quick story. Um, not a long time ago, one of the worst days of my life when I was mayor was when Brianna Allen, who was five years old, was killed on her cousin's porch at his birthday party. Two guys came by that were looking to hurt somebody. They pulled out an AK-47. They sprayed the porch, blew her guts out, killed her. Um, and then one of the bullets went down the street and, street and hit a, a, a young woman whose name was Tawana that had just turned the corner with two kids in a car going to return a rental car. It was, it was awful. She was buried, her, her funeral was at a church, and it was an awful experience. A couple of weeks later, I went back to that church to engage with the community, and they had a, a group of five or six-year-olds in the room. And they were full of joy and life in this space where a young girl like her just died, you know, was buried. And you could see they were excited, and they were talking about what they were gonna be, and life was a great promise. I went back to that same place uh, about a year later and I talked to kids that were 10 or 11. And I could see that their eyes started to dim, that the hope wasn't as much, that they began to feel the weight of life. They had been touched by trauma. And it was 
it was one of the most heartbreaking things that I had seen. Now we're going to jump forward to today because we have a lot of students here from Dillard, from Southern, from Xavier, Lusher's in the house. Um, I see the exact opposite now. I find that these kids today are fierce. Kate's kids are fierce at Sunflower County. They have woken up to what they think is possible in the world. And if there is a sense of hope, they just need a little bit of daylight. This is what's unbelievable. And I find them to be, uh, at least in my class, they keep me on my toes and they challenge us. And we had a, we had a little um, field trip the other day and we had a couple of police officers talk to the kids and they, you know, they, we got into the issue of stop and frisk. And a couple of the officers, and there was a DA, you know, gave them a story about when police officers stop and frisk. And it was thoughtful. It was, a, it was an easy and nice recitation of Terry versus Ohio, which is the constitutional case that tells you what's supposed to be. And when they left, and these guys are great guys, and I know them, and they were wonderful, but I asked two of the kids, they here, I'm not going to call you all out. I said, what did you all think about that? They said, they lying. <laughs> and I said, well, wait now. I said, hold up. I said, they weren't really, and they go, no, 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 that's not what they said. That's not how it is. And so what, I, what I'm saying to is there's a communion that has to occur between their experience and them speaking, feeling the ability to speak truth to power. We, we our job is to identify, to give them the room, to give them the freedom, and to listen to what they have to say because they know the truth. And I, f I find... Uh, I, don't know what, I don't know what's going on, but I find that as dark as it gets on the national level, I find the kids are getting much fiercer yes, and are like, we are not letting the left behind. We do not know like what the adults are doing in yeah. this country. We are going to take responsibility. I think the Parkland kids gave everybody else in the country this sense that you don't have to be a 58-year-old yeah, bald-headed white man you know, to get anything. I don't know who I might be talking about. <laughs> to get anything done, and, and they're just really kind of taking it on, and I would encourage you guys, this is your country, this is your future, you're going to lead it, and you might as well start today. All right, thank you, Justin. I like it. All right, everybody, we have to get to work and, and clear the way so that they can, they can uh, build their own journeys forward. Uh, I want to thank all three of you. That was such an amazing panel and wonderful conversation. Thank you. In every place that we visited, it was nearly universal for people to say that arts, sports, and culture bring people together to find common ground and common purpose. Across the South, we have uh, common culture and things that we do, our way of life. Generous people, beautiful landscape, great food. What are kind of the things in this community that bring people together? Food. Oh, hey, yes. I do think the farmer's market that Nourish Not School runs does bring a lot of people together that normally would never be together. Greenville uh, is known for many festivals. We have an awesome hot tamale festival. You can't leave out the blues festival. The blues festival. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And you have people, not only a diverse group from the community, but from the state and around the world. If you know anything about the South and sports, you know we love our football. High school football, college football, the SEC, and pro ball. It's in our bloodstream. In terms of bringing people uh, together? Football. 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 The football games. Football season is a fun time for all of us in the South. Things like that unite us. When we come together, we can create change, and but we can't do that as when we do it together. And now to close our program, please welcome Cleo Wade. y'all hear me? You know, I, um, I just came straight from the airport um, off a flight. And from the second I walked into this room, I, I'm seven months pregnant, and um, my baby has been doing cartwheels. <laughs> and I think somehow uh, she knows she's home uh, and knows that she's in a very special room. I um, I'm so grateful to be here today, and um, I'm so thankful to Mitch and Cheryl Landrew for having me um, 
Many of you may not know this, but their uh, eldest daughter, Grace, is my lifelong best friend. And they basically raised me and are two of the greatest influences in not just how I move through the world, but also in my work, uh, including uh, this piece I'm about to read from my book, which, you know, I didn't tell you this, Cheryl, but, you know, Mitch is actually in this book but I referred to him um, by his official name, um, my best friend Grace's dad once said. <laughs> and so I forgot to tell him. But um, this, is, this is from a poem called Where to Begin. The world will say to you, we need to end racism. Start by healing it in your own family. The world will say to you, how do we speak to bias and bigotry? Start by having the first conversation at your own kitchen table. The world will say to you, there is too much hate. Devote yourself to love. Love yourself so much that you can love others without barriers and without judgment. When the world asks us big questions that require big answers, we have two options. One, to feel so overwhelmed or unqualified, we do nothing. Two, to begin, to start with one small act and qualify ourselves. I am the director of national security, and so are you. Sure, no one appointed us, and there were no Senate confirmations, but we can secure a nation when we help just one person to be more secure, our nation is more secure. With just one outstretched hand that says, are you okay? I am here for you. We have the power to transform insecurity into security. We find ourselves saying to the world, what do we do? What can I do? The better question might be, how am I showing up? I ask the world for peace, but do I show up with peace when I see my family and friends? I ask the world to put a stop to hatred, but do I show up with love for not only those I know, but those I do not know? Do I show up with love for those whose ideas conflict with my own? I ask the world to end suffering, but do I show up for those who are suffering on my street corner? We say to the world, please change. We need change. But how do we show up to change our own lives? How do we show up to change the lives of the people in our communities? James Baldwin said, everything now we must assume is in our own hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. And this has always been true. No one nominated Harriet Tubman to her purpose, to her courage, to her mission. She did not say, I am not a congressperson or the president of the United States, so how could I? possibly participate in the fight to abolish a system as big as slavery. She instead spent 10 years making 19 trips, freeing 300 people, one person at a time. Think about the children of those 300 people, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and beyond. Our right immeasurable ripples in the endless river of justice. Whether it was Hurricane Katrina, Harvey, Irma, or Maria. So much damage, what could we even do? 
man and child they came across.